Hello everyone, welcome to Radiology Case Review Series. In this video, we are going to look at serial imaging of a child who was noted to have an abnormally dilated subhepatic vessel in utero. We initially started with ultrasound examination on day two of life. On the ultrasound examination, you can see a dilated vascular channel along the undersurface of the liver, which appears to join the IVC. So patient underwent CT examination for further characterization of this vessel. So let's look at the CT images. So on the CT images, you can clearly see a dilated vessel which is connecting to the left portal vein branch. As I follow back and forth, you can see the extrahepatic portal vein. Then it bifurcates into right and left portal veins. And the left portal vein is communicating to this dilated extrahepatic vascular channel, which eventually joins the IVC right atrium region. So patient was lost to follow up and represented many years later, at which point we did an MRI examination for evaluation of suspected liver mass. So let's look at the MRI images. On the MRI axial T to haste images, you can see a large mass pretty much replacing the entire left lobe of the liver. So within this mass, there appears to be a second mass. So there is a mass in mass appearance within the left lobe of the liver. Similar findings are also seen on the coronal haste images where there is a large mass replacing the left lobe of the liver with an additional mass within this, giving the mass and mass appearance. So patient received intravenous contrast for further evaluation using the liver mass protocol. So in our liver mass protocol, we use both extracellular contrast agent, Gadavist and hepatobiliary contrast agent, Evovist, and we acquire images using GRASP sequence. This is a nice article which goes through the technique and the utility of GRASP sequence published by Chandrana Group from NYU. So essentially grass, on GRASP imaging, the images are obtained using multi-coil compressed sensing and golden angle radial sampling. Also the images are acquired in continuous breathing. GRASP stands for golden angle radial sparse parallel imaging. So the advantage of GRASP images is that it is a retrospective reconstruction of images in any time phase you want. So we can acquire or rather reconstruct the images in any phase like arterial venous and delayed venous phase. And also the patient is free breathing. So this is particularly of great use in pediatric patients. So let's look at the GRASP images. So the first set of data is after administration of extracellular contrast agent. And you can clearly see this large mass replacing the left lobe of the liver. And within that there is a second heterogeneous mass with possible regions of necrosis. On the delayed hepatobiliary contrast agent images, you can see multiple lesions which retain hepatobiliary contrast agent in the right lobe of the liver which potentially suggests these could be FNH. Also the large lesion in the left lobe of the liver also retains hepatobiliary contrast agents with some foci which are not retaining the contrast. And the second mass within this lesion does not retain much in terms of hepatobiliary contrast agents. So the appearances suggest there are multiple lesions. Most of them seems to be FNH. This large lesion in the left lobe has rather unusual appearances. It could be FNH which has undergone malignant degeneration. Also on the other MRI sequences, we did not see any evidence of fat. So the MRI appearances, as I said, is rather atypical. So it's still unclear. Patient was scheduled for partial hepatectomy. And as part of pre-surgical workup, patient underwent venogram evaluation. So on the venogram images, as you can see, the contrast is being injected through the IVC. You can clearly identify abnormal communication between the left portal vein extending into IVC. So you can clearly see on this digital subtraction images, the catheter is coming from the right atrium IVC going into this abnormal channel which joins the left portal vein. And as further contrast is administered, you can see the portal venous branches in the right lobe. There are some branches in the segment four of the liver, but not many branches seen in the segment two and segment three of left lobe of liver. Also balloon occlusion test was performed to evaluate the pressure in the portal vein and the gradient across the portosystemic collateral. So we are dealing with a child who has 
congenital extrahepatic portosystemic shunt, a abnormal vessel connecting the left portal vein to the IVC, who over span of many years has developed multiple nodules throughout the liver. The largest lesion in the left lobe of the liver has rather unusual imaging appearances with mass within mass, also retains hepatobiliary contrast agent. So this was the impression from the venogram images which confirmed the large extrahepatic portosystemic shunt from the left portal vein to the right atrium. So we are dealing with congenital extrahepatic portosystemic shunt which is known as Abernathy malformation. So there are various types, type 1 and type 2. In type 1 there is end-to-end -end communication between the portal system to the inferior vena cava which can be between the splenic vein, the SMV directly joining the IVC or the portal vein directly ending into the IVC. These are type 1A and type 1B. In type 2, there is a side-to-side -side anastomosis between the portal vein and the IVC. So I think our patient has type 2 Abernathy malformation. So this is a nice article which analyzed the hepatocellular nodules seen in Abernathy malformation. So as we saw in our patient, these patients are at risk of developing multiple hepatocellular nodules due to abnormal portal blood flow and most of these nodules are FNH however there are also instances where these nodules turned out to be hepatocellular adenomas or hepatocellular carcinomas. So as we know hepatocellular adenomas are four types HNF1-alpha inactivated, inflammatory hepatocellular adenoma, beta-catenin activated hepatocellular adenoma and unclassified hepatocellular adenoma. In their group, they had 16 nodules in 5 patients who underwent liver transplant. The most common nodule was FNH which was more than 60%. The second most common nodule was beta-catenin hepatocellular adenoma. So as we know, beta-catenin hepatocellular adenoma can undergo malignant transformation. So when patients with Abernathy malformation develops nodule, they may need surgical or other interventional treatment. So in our patient at pathology, the lesion turned out to be well to moderately differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma arising from hepatocellular adenoma. So on sampling, they found that the portal tracts were not easily identifiable in the left lobe of liver. Overall findings were consistent with congenital absence of portal vein, i.e. Abernathy malformation. On further analysis, they concluded that most of the lesions was well differentiated hepatocellular proliferation with pseudoacinate formation, mild cellular atypia, focally thickened hepatic cord plates, and nuclear beta-catenin expression was positive. So these features were consistent with beta-catenin mutated hepatic adenoma as we saw in the research paper. They are at risk of malignant degeneration. If anyone is interested in learning more about Abernathy malformation, I would strongly recommend them to read this article. The QR code is available here. I hope you found this case to be interesting. Thanks for your attention.